The United States claims the war against ISIL is one of the most precise air campaigns in history and says that only one in every 157 airstrikes in Iraq results in a civilian death. But a recent New York Times investigation found that civilians in Iraq are actually dying at 31 times that rate. And of course, Iraqis have been dying in Iraq from war, terrorism and sanctions for decades now. But why do so many of their deaths remain uncounted? And is the US military lying about the impact of its airstrikes in Iraq? Joining me to discuss this are Azmat Khan, co-author of the New York Times Magazine investigation, The Uncounted, and John Tierman, executive director at MIT Center for International Studies and author of the book, The Deaths of Others, The Fate of Civilians in America's Wars. Uh, thank you both for joining me on up front. Um, Azmat, why did you set out with your co-author Anand Gopal to conduct this 18-month investigation into civilian casualties in Iraq? What prompted you and what did you think you would find? Well, it wasn't just the scale of bombing or the tens of thousands of airstrikes in both Iraq and Syria that have been carried out since August 2014. We didn't hear a lot from civilians and the coalition itself was not investigating on the ground. And so both Anand and I really wanted to do a systematic sample, looking both at those airstrikes that successfully hit legitimate ISIS targets and those that resulted in civilian casualties or deaths. And so by going to three different ISIS territories, downtown Kayara, downtown Shora, and the Aden district of East Mosul, three areas that reflected typical ISIS-held territories, we were able to case the site of every single airstrike in each of these areas and determine that one in five of those airstrikes resulted in a civilian death. Now, this is 31 times higher than the numbers that the coalition has admitted to if you study its reports. And what we found is that in about half of the total airstrikes in this 103 sample uh, that resulted in civilian deaths, uh, of those civilian death airstrikes, half of them were the result of poor or outdated intelligence, most likely. We were unable so to discern an ISIS target nearby. Is that lack of transparency because of an indifference to civilian casualties on the part of the U.S. military? Is it incompetence when it comes to recording them? Or is it sheer brazen dishonesty? They're lying to us about the extent of the civilian death toll. What do you think? Is it any one of those? I came to the conclusion that many internally know that these numbers are vastly wrong and have done very little to try to correct them. Okay. Uh, John Tierman, for years you've written about the loss of civilian lives in U.S. wars from World War II to Korea to Vietnam, more recently in Afghanistan and Iraq. Some might say, John, that far fewer people are killed from precision-guided, quote-unquote, U.S. missiles today than were killed in the firebombing of Dresden or during the Second World War or in the paddy fields of Vietnam. Is that fair? Well, certainly that's that's true, although it depends on on what the strategy is. So, for example, in Korea uh, in 1950-53, we basically leveled the whole of North Korea uh, with uh, strategic bombing. That was an intentional act, and it was called, in fact, in those days, it was called terror bombing. Um, so it depends on what the military mm -hmm. is actually trying to do. But it's true that the technology is better today. But I think the results of bombing, the actual consequences on the ground for strategy, uh, has not measured up to this so-called precision. That is, the, the, the reason we even have uh, an Islamic State kind of phenomenon is because of the toll that was exacted in the Iraq War beginning in 2003. That is, this is a reaction to the remarkable devastation uh, brought on by that invasion and occupation. Azmat, your 18-month investigation covered both the end of the Obama presidency and the beginning of the Trump presidency. Are things worse under Trump in terms of the quantity of airstrikes and the sheer number of civilian casualties in Iraq? Uh, by the numbers, yes, but to attribute that to the Trump administration is tricky, and, and here's why. Part of this spike that we've seen in civilian deaths is certainly the result of the pace of operations and the fact that Mosul was being retaken. Uh, part of that is a change in rules, and, and just to, to be very clear, uh, there was a change in December of 2016 under President Obama that allowed more ground commanders the authority to call in airstrikes or to approve airstrikes. That happened under Obama, and many believe that 
uh, these directives uh, have been a part of that spike that we've seen in civilian deaths. Now, just even but looking but at the government. Didn't Donald Trump also do that? In, in May 2017, Trump said he gave his commanders, quote, total authorization to make complex combat decisions, which some have he attributed. Said that, but when you look at the actual when you look at the actual directives, there are really only two. There was one in December of 2016 and one that occurred the day that he came into office. Those are the two that I've confirmed through credible reporting. Now, certainly there's a lot of rhetoric that comes out of President Trump's mouth about what he intends to do, but when you actually look at what's happening, the military is in charge here. But in through the course of my reporting and through nearly two years of investigation, I also found mass casualty incidents that happened under the previous administration. I would say that the press is now paying more attention Certainly more people who were not politicized about airstrikes under the previous administration are now paying attention. Uh, John, you've been covering the deaths of civilians in Iraq for many years now, long before ISIL turned up on the scene. You were one of the people behind the famous Lancet survey into civilian casualties from the war in Iraq, which estimated 650,000 excess Iraqi deaths related to the war and the occupation. How do studies like that one compare to journalistic investigations like Azmat's? What's a more accurate and reliable way of counting the dead in a war zone like Iraq? To measure total mortality in a society, though, you need to do a broader survey because uh, looking at one district or two districts uh, does not tell you what you're missing in other places in the country. So what we did, uh, what I commissioned and what was done by Johns Hopkins researchers was a household survey, a randomized household survey of the entire country of Iraq. And that way, through estimations, you get a, a fairly good picture, not a totally uh, accurate picture. That is, you don't have a single number. You have a range uh, that you, you, you uh, estimate uh, of what mortality has been. And that has been confirmed by other surveys of a fairly broad range, but it's in the hundreds of thousands uh, in Iraq, which includes and, and civilians and to... combatants. John, what do you say to critics who even a decade later think that Lancet study and others like it, the other surveys you mentioned, inflated the death toll in Iraq for political reasons? They questioned the methodology, the sample size, the Main Street bias. A lot of people pushed back yeah. against those surveys, didn't they, at the time and since? Right. Well, the charge that it was a politically motivated um, is because the numbers were so high and people had to react to this in some way. Uh, President Bush was asked after the survey was released the next day, he said that the, that the methodology was not credible and the real number was about 50,000. But the military and the U.S. government simply don't have a way so, so of on, accounting for mortality. In so on wars. that note, John, let me ask you this. In the early days of the Afghan war, one of the top U.S. generals, Tommy Franks, famously said, we don't do body counts. Should the U.S. military, in your view, do body counts, have some formal way of recording civilian deaths that's public, accessible, checkable by journalists, researchers, human rights groups? It shouldn't be done by the military. The military has other obligations. They also have interests that can muddy the waters. It should be done by an independent agency of the U.S. government using a number of different methods, household surveys and other things, uh, that will give us a more accurate picture and really be able to tell the American people and people of the world what the costs of, and the consequences of these wars are. Asma, do you want to come in? I, I I want to jump in here, yes. So uh, just, just to be clear, what I've heard from people internally who both are at CENTCOM, at the Air Force and others, is that uh, you know when they calculate before an airstrike, they do a collateral damage estimate, a CDE as it's known, and they determine you know what the likelihood for civilian death is before an airstrike. If they were to make those numbers public and those collateral damage estimates are classified, their numbers would very likely reflect what we found on the ground in our investigation, and in fact would show those collateral damage to be, you know, as they call them, significantly higher even. John, when you have civilian deaths in Iraq at the hands of the U.S. and its allies on the level we've seen in Iraq, uh, on the level uh, that's documented by Azmat, uh, isn't that just a gift to groups like ISIL? Doesn't a war fought in this way that kills so many civilians just perpetuate the threat from quote-unquote terrorist groups who hate the U.S., who hate the West, who are looking for grievances in order to justify their narratives and recruit new members? Yes, I'm afraid so. And I think that the, even the phenomenon of the Islamic State is attributable to the destruction 
of the 2003 war. The, uh, the devastation is not just about people being killed. It is also about them uh, being displaced, losing their livelihoods, losing their schools, their hospitals, their clean water, uh, and so on. I mean, it's a, it's a very vast um, destructiveness that, that besets these societies. And of course, they're not going to like us as a result. They don't care about the, the rationales for war but they do care about what their daily lives are. Just to jump in here, at least in terms of the United States, if you are talking to Iraqis on the ground and their perspective on the United States when it comes to these civilian deaths, that ship has sailed. That is done. Many There is very little reputation for the United States to salvage in Iraq when it comes to just the country and anti-Americanism. What you do have, though, what you do have is uh, disenfranchisement and and, and strong feelings of resentment towards the, the national government. And as a result, with these populations that were incredibly angry about the political process, they were more susceptible to take over by ISIS. So unless you're resolving those political differences yeah. or this feeling that their own government is not accommodating them, you're very likely to see the ability for a group like ISIS to, to hold sway with them again. And as well, let me just ask you this before we run out of time. You talk about the Iraqi public. What about the American public? Many would argue that, you know, average Americans have now been desensitized to these foreign wars and these bombing campaigns. They just are kind of indifferent, apathetic, 16 years into this so-called war on terror. Do you think you've actually changed any hearts or minds in the United States? Well, one of the big reasons why there is a relative apathy isn't just that it's been 16 years, it's that we don't have troop surges. So certainly at its peak, when the United States was sending large hundreds of thousands of troops to Iraq and Afghanistan, there was very strong resistance by many Americans. But now when this is conducted largely via the air, and as many American soldiers are not dying in this war, uh, many people aren't as interested. Okay, so let me ask you this, John, last question to you. Is it simply the case that when it comes to fighting American wars abroad, you've been documenting them for many years, is it simply the case that black and brown lives don't matter? Racism does play into it. I don't think there's any question. Other factors play into it. But I think it's the unwillingness to confront the horror of what has occurred on the ground that creates this turning away and indifference, basically. John Azmat, we'll have to leave it there. Thanks for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.